By the time this video goes live, we'll be past halfway through February 2018, almost celebrating the one year anniversary of the Nintendo Switch, which will have gotten its first pretty amazing launch year under its belt. Nintendo put out two legitimate Game of the Year contenders for 2017, in a year that was infamous for finally pushing what developers and publishers could get away with until various and very public outcries finally occurred. In a year of big name disappointments, be it from disappointing sequels that many felt either regressed, embraced the scourge that is microtransactions, and or loot boxes in egregious ways, or simply chose to remain complacent, it was nice to see Japan truly retake the reins last year from quote triple A Western developers with their monetary greed and anti-consumer business practices over pure gameplay and honest attempts at fun. Japanese game studios became pretty vital in terms of making fantastic games that single-handedly allowed me a legitimate sigh of relief in what was initially a very promising year for many, myself included. I am obviously referring to Nintendo's output and how much of an underdog story they once again pulled off. Not since the Wii's runaway success in 2006, arguably 2005 if you include the beginning of their Blue Ocean strategy with the then momentum building DS line, had Nintendo showed how they can not only reinvent themselves once again, but also help influence the direction gaming chose to imitate in the mid-2000s. But let's not dwell on the recent past, I'm going to be discussing the far more distant past. To be honest, I'm going to be slightly gushing over the Super Mario games for the better part of an hour, so I'll keep this video as focused as my rambling self can do. In short, Nintendo was a beacon of excellence and a prime contender for best developer of 2017 as far as I'm concerned, given how they spread out their first year of a new console handheld hybrid system, going so far as to offer the two best games I played in 2017 as Game of the Year contenders, one of which definitely is my top pick. This video was originally meant to happen around the end of November 2017, back when Super Mario Odyssey was riding high during the ever-crowded annual fall release video game schedule. It was a game I had beaten so far as completing the super hard final challenge the main games like to throw at the end for the dedicated to test their skills. I had meant for a Donkey Kong Arcade Classics retrospective to happen before tackling Mario, you know, all the arcade versions like the original Donkey Kong 2, 3, and all that jazz, but when my laptop died on me and losing a bunch of footage in the process back in November, coupled with not having figured out how to adequately record Game Boy games as of yet, that got put on indefinite hold in favor of celebrating one of, if not the most recognizable video game series of all time, ahead of schedule. So here we are. Considering these games have been discussed to death, I wasn't sure exactly what angle to tackle these classic games in, so I'm just going to hit the entire NES trilogy, asterisk, in this video. I'll likely be reiterating a bunch of regurgitated information that most averagely informed video gamers, and especially fellow Nintendo fans, are already aware of, so thank you for your patience and let's just dive into this. Note I'll be mostly addressing the Wii port of Super Mario All-Stars, as I have multiple copies of these games in various formats across different platforms, but it's much easier to simply pop in this specific disc for ease of access. Sorry for those who wanted to largely see the original 8-bit graphics exclusively. I love them too, and I actually do have the Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt NES combination cartridge, and the virtual console version of the Lost Levels, but it's simply easier for me to stick with one disc for this particular retrospective for a few reasons. Timestamps are in the description to help you if you need a handy quick click. Okay, retrospective time. Super Mario Bros. hardly needs any introduction. It's an iconic series in video games and is still around when it's nearing its 40th anniversary. How crazy is that? It's a masterclass in game design and is still referenced in and out of its own series. I don't think I could possibly say any more on this particular game that hasn't already been discussed in much better conversations, so I'll just go in being enthusiastic on what I like, dislike, admire, and how good the game feels to me today. While Super Mario Bros. isn't the first game in the franchise, I will briefly do a history lesson for completion's sake. Though one can say, I like Mario games, that simple phrase can either denote the main platforming games or also refer to the 17 plus sub-series it's connected to. Mario did start out in the arcade classic Donkey Kong, then a carpenter known as Jumpman. He later appeared in the arcade game Mario Bros. that furthered the platforming theme, and introduced a few now-standard elements of the series, and started a few Game & Watch titles before finally landing in the Super Mario games, the then so-called main series of platformers. 
Having ditched Lady slash Pauline and Donkey Kong, Mario and presumably his brother Luigi as well for the two-player modes, reside in the Mushroom Kingdom. When a band of dark magic-wielding turtles known as the Koopas invade and transform the inhabitants into inanimate objects and kidnap seven Mushroom Retainers and the Mushroom King's daughter, Princess Toadstool, Mario answers the distress call and sets out to rescue them. This is a tale as old as time as far as video game plots are concerned, beaten only by sports games, alien invasions, and the rising genre of role-playing games. You aren't playing the original Super Mario Bros. for its story. Gameplay is king for Nintendo's main mascot, as it remains to this day. You play as one of the Brothers Mario as you explore the eight worlds of the Mushroom Kingdom to save a princess from magic-wielding turtle dragon. Simple and to the point, as a few cynical folks might point out we've hardly stepped out of this premise, but I'm setting that aside for now. The gameplay in Super Mario Bros. is simplicity itself. You move left and right, climb beanstalks, duck to avoid attacks, slide under low tunnels and enter pipes, run, throw fireballs for a projectile attack, and most importantly, jump. This is as classic as platformers get, and not without good reason. Previous games Mario starred in used the arcade premise of single-screen stages, so Super Mario Bros. utilizing a scrolling stage for seamless and interconnected stages was very liberating, and I imagine a breath of fresh air for those playing in the 80s. Ah, uh, the good old days when technological jumps actually boosted game design over graphics. Bad gym, stay focused. Today, many can easily spot the tropes that help codify platformers. You travel an obstacle course, usually from left to right, collecting various objects and avoiding hazards until you reach your goal. Like many games from the 80s, a live system and score were included for that fast-paced arcade feel for bragging rights, though most will likely only care about the timer on each stage, usually around 400 in-game seconds, which really translates to about 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Unless you're the obsessive type to break every block they see, defeat every enemy, and collect every coin, the timer normally won't be an issue for most average players, barring a few of the later stages, in particular some castle levels with repeating puzzle elements. I'll get to those more when I hit the lost levels. So, the actual game. I've only summarized this classic in the most technical of terms, because it's what most platform Mario games are. The rules are so simple anyone can pick them up and figure out the gist of them within 10 minutes. It's what helped Mario become a cultural and worldwide icon in the medium. He helped raise so many kids growing up in the 80s and 90s, becoming as recognizable as Mickey Mouse at one point, that it's hard to find someone who doesn't know who the red-capped plumber of all trades is by now. You see the blue overalls on the red hat and mustache face, and that's just Mario. That's brand power that you just can't buy, when one of the figureheads of gaming has been around and stayed relevant for nearly 40 years after his debut. That's really impressive for any medium. And it all comes down to how this landmark game feels to play. While the controls are definitely more rigid than his games are today, Mario still feels responsive to control. He has a reasonable walking pace, and the more experienced player will adjust to his running speed and extra momentum, granting more advanced play for those who can cover ground with quick reflexes if you nail the physics of his simple jump. Even back in 85, you could either hop off a Goomba to nail two or three at a time, or hold down the A button off a Paracoupa to gain that little extra bit of height to reach a ledge you know a power-up is hidden on. The ability to now slightly adjust Mario or Luigi's jump mid-air to land on a single block or hop on a moving Lakitu was something many games didn't let you do before. Heck, in Mario's previous entries you were basically locked into a jump once you initiated one. When you jumped over a barrel in Donkey Kong, regardless if you were stationary or moving, you were committed to your jump through thick and thin, leading to those older arcade classics to feel more rigid and mechanical than most of Mario's modern library. It's a deliberate choice back then, since the arcade games had you jumping over barrels and fireballs and spike turtles on a singular screen. But Super Mario Bros. had bigger and longer stages. They followed a similar overall pattern. Your first level in a world would often be an overworld one coupled with the legendary theme music. The second one would take you in a pipe half the time, leading you down to either an underground stage or an underwater one, followed by a third stage that threw more of the world's theming at you, often in an athletic theme, with way more bottomless pits, all to end in a climactic battle where Mario faced seven fake Bowsers to save multiple mushroom retainers, before finally reaching the eighth and final castle where the real King of the Koopa awaited with the princess. It's a great usage of basic resources, such as the clouds and bushes sharing the same sprites, and doing the palette swap trick for an easy distinguishing visual representation of either a stronger or smarter enemy, or simply a change in theme. Might as well hit upon the art direction here, but there's not much new that I can add in this department. 
8-bit graphics are always nostalgic to the older gaming crowd, of which I suppose I'm kind of in at this point. I do love my nostalgia, and can even remember to take off those goggles for things I still like. Bad gym focus up. And all the sprite work from this game is legendary. People know Mario when they see him, even in 8-bit form. His design was one of my favorite solutions to an often negatively seen problem, creativity born of limitations. To digress a bit here, I want to address how limitations can enhance video games when clever and resourceful developers turn that problem into a blessing. In this current age of digital games that can be streamed and downloaded on a whim, and with how swiftly technology has advanced with cutting-edge computers and beloved consoles, I feel we sometimes as an industry lose the forest through the trees. Just because you can make details such as ants crawling on a tree, see the pores on a player's skin, and experience realistic weather patterns, technology is available to us from a pure technical computing perspective, that doesn't mean you should chase that rainbow with the goal of solely finding the pot of gold if it means ignoring the difficult path it takes to get there. I lost focus in that analogy, but hear me out. When it came to older games in the third generation of consoles, where systems like the Nintendo Entertainment System and Sega's Master System defined the era, games were given much more advancements than before, from scrolling backgrounds that could have decent actual backgrounds instead of purely black voids, to the now standard D-pad and white assortment of color palettes. Even then, these were still 2040p games, especially primitive to our now HD expectation of visuals. You had to make each sprite count, and as such, these limitations helped design some of the most enduring and recognizable characters of all time. Mario, for instance, wore a red hat because hair was too difficult to easily convey, as well as why he has a big nose and mustache. A mouth was simply too difficult to portray. Add to that overalls that could more easily distinguish arms from legs, and voila, a timeless and recognizable character design was born. Same thing with the music. There were only around a dozen compositions in the first game, some being short snippets of completing a stage and dying, with the remaining being the hurry-up versions of the level themes. What there is, for a now small soundtrack, remains memorable and catchy to this day even 33 years later. It was all about making themes that would stick with the player, so that if you ever hear this game's bouncy waltz, you would immediately picture a plumber swimming around coral, cheap cheeps, and bloopers. Point being, limitations can sometimes stifle what a game can be, yes. We've all had our titles that never reach their full potential to us thanks to technological limitations, or a game that aimed for the stars and couldn't quite reach the clouds, biting off more than they could chew, resulting in a poorly optimized game. But limitations aren't always a bad thing. If games didn't constantly promise what they if games didn't constantly promise what they weren't sure they could actually keep by release, bleh, but limitations aren't always a bad thing. If games didn't constantly promise what they weren't sure they could actually keep by release, this wouldn't be as big of an issue that it can blow up to be. Bull shots are a problem that the majority don't really seem to care about, since nothing of consequence ever really happens. It's something I appreciate Nintendo for. Most of the time when they show off a new game, it looks rougher than some might expect or hope when first looking at it. So many Nintendo games in the last decade especially get pointed out online as rough looking for how honest they're being in their unfinished games, but they usually end up looking way more polished in the end, so it's a moot point. Sorry, focusing up again. Being a launch title for the NES, Super Mario Bros. did its job. It showcased a must-have game for the then uncertain video game industry after the infamous crash years earlier. It took a redesigned Japanese video game console to market itself as an entertainment system that came out with some quality titles and helped the industry bounce back, with the rest being history. Super Mario Bros. is a good game, though it's certainly debatable on where one would rank it in a best video games of all time list. It's all subjective after all, but the historical significance of the title cannot be understated. So now that I've done an excessively glowing romantic view on the original game, it's time to shift gears into a more analytical approach with its sequel slash expansion pack. Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels is one of the titles this game goes by. It was originally called Super Mario Bros. 2 when it released in Japan, for super players in the deluxe port for Game Boy Color, whatever you call it, this game is basically an enhanced hard mode, a level pack, an expansion, many classifications for this same game. 
one fans outside of Japan wouldn't actually receive until the original Super Mario All-Stars compilation of the 8-bit games remastered for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System came out seven years later in 1993. The game was also included in Super Mario Bros. Deluxe in the form of a For Super Players mode, but the original unaltered title was eventually released for Wii on its virtual console service, so there's plenty of ways to get your hands on this game now. Since the game was both very similar looking to its predecessor and was significantly more difficult, something even a Mario vet like me can attest to, just look at those numerous deaths, Nintendo of America decided to pass on the title, instead dealing with what the world now knows as Super Mario Bros. 2, which I will get into slightly after the lost levels. Instead dealing with what the world now knows as Super Mario Bros. 2, which I will get to very soon. It did eventually get released, as previously stated, for Super Players, and it's the enhanced port on All-Stars that I will remain focused on for consistency's sake. Because the Lost Levels resumes its difficulty from the original Super Mario Bros., I will take the time to discuss both games' mechanics, since I'd be repeating myself otherwise, and it's the Lost Levels in particular that helps illustrate the more minute details of the original classic title. Super Mario Bros. is very accessible to anyone. The simplicity of its controls and gameplay make it a perfect game for anyone interested in video games to just jump right in. World 1-1 in the original game has been discussed to death on how it's a masterclass of video game design. That first Goomba has probably killed more players than any other enemy in video game history. It organically teaches players the basics of the game, forcing the player to only go right, to jump above the angry mushroom trader, to accept the bright colored mushroom, to jump and hit blocks for power-ups, and jumping over obstacles, learning what is and isn't harmful. It then goes ahead teaching the player organically how to time your jumps by coupling Goombas to see if a player learns that they can just hold that other button longer for a higher jump adding a pit to fall in to incentivize pushing that other button, and finding out it makes you run, maybe discover that you can duck into those giant green pipes, run into hidden blocks for a 1-up mushroom, discover a fire flower if you realize small Mario dies on contact with hazards, while Super and Fire Mario gives you a second chance. That a timer exists if you dilly-dally too long, the Star Man that makes you invincible for its legendary music, the list goes on. It's a fantastic opening level to an influential game that I really can't add any more to the discussion here. Which leads me into discussing how the Lost Levels ensures that you understand the nuances of the mechanics, for you will not complete this game unless you learn inside and out how Super Mario Bros. operates. The original Super Mario Bros. is able to ease players into its suite of 32 stages and cast of 17 enemies. Goombas eternally walk forward with no protection or any fear for their lives. Koopas retreat into their shells when jumped upon and can be kicked for additional challenge. Buzzy Beetles are fireproof Koopas in practice. Lakitus throw spiny eggs from on high, while fire bars and lava bubbles introduce Bowser's fire-themed hazards. These are all well-known aspects of the franchise by this point. While Super Mario Bros. gets more difficult in its later half, particularly World 7 and 8 will legitimately challenge players by throwing in increasingly nasty combinations, the Lost Levels assumes you have beaten the original game and immediately begins its World 1-1 with a much more difficult game that doesn't pull its punches. Right out of the gate, it sends a Paracoopa after you, hiding its first Super Mushroom in a contained space that requires the player to knock it out if they want to use it, in addition to the new Poison Mushroom that counts as damage. By including more red Koopas that stay on their platforms, numerous piranha plants poking out of warp pipes, and more bottomless pits amidst trickier platforming stages, the Lost Levels demands only the best and most competent of players. The term Nintendo Hard applies to this level of arcade-style masochism. I always think I'm an above-average Mario player until I return to this game. It requires such an intimate understanding of the original game's physics that it was legitimately harrowing to record the footage for this very retrospective. It's here that many current players of more recent Mario games can more easily discern the differences in the classic games versus the new line of 2D Mario games. I know, it's kind of confusing. While you can and must hop off enemies to reach certain platforms in the Lost Levels, the physics are way more stiff than later games. 
The amount of times I expected to gain more airtime after hitting off a Paracoupa killed me more times than I care to admit here. This is admittedly more on me, since I just came off of playing more games like Super Mario Odyssey and its 2D sections, and the physics from the new series, but it bears stating for gamers who never really played the original title. It's why I like going to the beginning of these series when I start a series run-through. Taking months, if not years, off of a series allows my muscle memory to more easily forget how newer games play, and makes it more accessible for me to adjust where a series began before sequels helped refine its controls and gameplay. As I'm showing, I had many, many deaths replaying The Lost Worlds. I'm not ashamed to admit that. This game is brutal, and you really feel a proper sense of pride and accomplishment when you overcome these challenges. Due to this increase in difficulty, while getting a game over in the original Super Mario Bros. causes you to begin all the way back to World 1-1, unless you knew the button combination on the original NES game or playing the All-Stars version here, the Lost Levels allows you to resume the world in which you died. This is further assisted in All-Stars, as you can now resume Super Mario Bros. from any world you had begun from the file select screen, and the Lost Worlds now remembers each individual stage you have reached a feature I very much appreciated as I began to die more and more to difficult hazards and my own slow collapse into frustrated insanity. While some can consider this a dumbing down of the original two games' intentions, I see these save options as welcome quality of life improvements. While Super Mario Bros. can be beaten anywhere from 1 to 3 hours in its base form, the option to save and or suspend your progress is obviously a welcome addition. This is an option that you don't have to take if you want to play the All-Stars version of the games properly. Simply save and quit back to the main menu, and roll back the level selection to 1-1, problem solved. An optional change like this doesn't really affect my perception of the lost levels in particular. Making the game more accessible is not a bad thing. The fact it gives you 5 lives instead of 3 can also be seen as making it easier, but if it really bothers you that much, you can simply, I don't know, die twice? Really, I don't think these are bad changes. In fact, this is what allowed me to power through the lost levels to actually complete it for the second time here. Not that I'm against hard games. That's the inherent reason for the lost levels to even exist. I love Super Mario Bros., so a super hard mode I heard about from classmates in middle school made me determined to play it, but I never had many Super NES games, and what I did was borrowed from friends and rented from Blockbuster of all places. But I never got a chance to try All-Stars until years later. The first time I finally beat the Lost Levels was on the Wii Virtual Console, and I've only beaten it the one time prior to this review. And that's mainly because you only get three lives and you had to restart the world when you game over. I remember it taking around a dedicated week, but I was eventually able to conquer the game and feel like I'd climb a digital Mount Everest. The satisfaction of surpassing something that makes you string obscenities and various forms of cleverness is its own reward. As such, All-Stars is a way for anyone to tackle the game with a bit more assistance. By restarting from each level that you die on, I was able to ingrain each stage and not worry about the life system as much. Sure, I'd lose the odd checkpoint every now and then, but the worst stages for me never had checkpoints, so I'd simply refocus on learning my trouble areas and basically adapting my strategy and eventually overcoming a challenge that would sometimes take me half an hour to nail a pinpoint jump. Which brings me to the specifics of Super Mario Bros. Playing the lost levels allows you to really appreciate how pinpoint accurate the games were designed. So many times I'd barely graze a fire bar or barely miss a Paracoupa I'm aiming for during a tricky jump, or my mortal enemy, somehow constantly jumping between the double and triple Goombas. No idea why I'm that lucky, but these mistakes are almost worse than the trickiest jumps for me, since it's obviously how I'm timing the jumps. Point being, I admire how accurate all the hitboxes are when you have to expertly time some of these obstacles. It can be frustrating to redo the same challenge over and over until you finally nail it, but that's part of the fun of this one. It's kind of a good demonstration on the difference between professionally designed levels and those made by anyone in something akin to Super Mario Maker. While I may have gotten heated at some of those stages in the lost levels, I never felt the challenges were too unfair that it was either determined by sheer luck or had every card stacked against me. There was always a solution that eventually presented itself, or I finally nailed a specific string of jumps by either slowing down to take it all in, or by memorizing a full speed run through some of the trickier hazards. On the other hand, it's statistically difficult to find good levels in something like Mario Maker simply because so many levels were designed to be gimmicks, the do-nothing ones being a good example. A lot of flair, but it's not 
actually a platforming challenge, more so than something to simply think, wow, that's neat, before quickly growing tired and wanting to actually play a level. Though the stages that kill you almost immediately, or those that have a hidden get out of jail free Starman or something, that avoids a literal wall of enemies, that's, that's just not fun. Come on, we can do better. Don't misunderstand me. I know it's not that easy to just make levels and have them either be fun or a decent challenge. It's something that these level creators really help shine a spotlight on, especially with something like the Mario series. Most Mario games are designed in one of two ways. The first is a natural curve that eases players into the game using the first half of itself before ramping up all the challenges in its backworlds, one that all these 8-bit classics do follow. Future 2D Mario games would give players a relatively easy to middling main quest, with a few gimmick stages here and there, while hiding the best challenges in the post-game, something that Super Mario Bros. 4 famously did. But here, you can consider the lost levels that post-game to the original. Professionally designed levels will always be preferable to 95% of what you'll run into when you give full control over to the players, which isn't meant to be shade. It's simply why, while I enjoy Super Mario Maker, the truly great levels were few and far between. While I'm on a semi-rant, might as well switch over to some of my minor gripes with this classic. While you have access to the normal tools of the platforming genre, including moving platforms, the ones that always give me trouble, or the trampolines, while the red ones in Super Mario Bros. weren't necessarily bad, I never quite liked the change in physics there. Now in the lost levels, there are green ones versus the regular reds that absolutely drive me insane. While I acknowledge that my timing is off on half of these, as seen in this footage, they not only alter your jump in a way that constantly cause me to fall into pits due to a lack of height, there are later stages that are utterly reliant on a combination of trampolines, winds, and the fact that you can't see where you are for half the level to time your jumps or landings. That circle of hell for me was World C3. Alright, I forgot to mention. While I first beat the Lost Levels on the Virtual Console version, in the midst of recording this footage and replaying for this review, I learned that there weren't simply 8 worlds like in Super Mario Bros., but also includes 5 extra worlds for a total of 13 worlds with 52 stages of varying madness. This was a genuinely pleasant surprise, even with all the added frustration of some truly devious levels. If you're able to beat the first 8 worlds without using any warp pipes to skip anything, you're rewarded with a surprise World 9 Fantasy World, which is made up of 4 very short levels, which led me to falsely believe it was a hidden thank you level, something that ended up being true, but little did I know there were worlds A through D that are truly crazy obstacle courses. These levels are definitely not for the faint of heart, even more so than the base game. I was able to beat them all though, I finally have video proof that I did try, die, and repeat many, 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 many times. It's one of those badges of honor in my gaming history that I truly am now proud of. Even with a few minor gripes that one can consider cheap, since I'm positive there's no way any new player would be able to instantly tackle this game without a game over, since there are many small adjustments that do make the game almost unfair. Some of my other bugbears are hidden blocks that either prematurely halt your intended jump over an enemy, leading into an unfair death, or if you're really lucky, also triggers a hidden poison mushroom to kick you while you're down. Those are my favorite. There's also the fact that virtually half the stages are designed to frustrate someone who likes to run through Mario stages, of which I very much am. This footage shows what happens if you charge forward on these stages. Memorization of hazards is required more so in the Lost Levels than in Super Mario Bros., for enemies are often designed to be in your landing path if you make a long-running jump over hazards, only to run into something that injures you, often killing me because I'm that kind of reckless in games I think I'm good at. I fully realize this may be a me-exclusive problem, but these are my opinions and observations on these classics, and I had to point it out. Other minor nitpicks include a few stages that are simply about rote memorization. While this may seem like a vapid nitpick due to many platformers often turning into semi-memorization challenges, the likes of which I'll address on a certain other competing platforming series in a later video, memorization is oftentimes not necessary for Mario games. They are typically designed organically enough to introduce the level's hazards, ease you into variations of that challenge, wrap it up for a climax, and then moving on to another theme or combination of traps. Memorization isn't necessary more so than it is just pure challenge and recognizing your obstacles at hand. Stages like World 5-3 in particular devolved into rote memorization for me, the likes of which tend to drive me up the wall. 
Admittedly a lesser issue since lives rarely matter in the All-Stars version, it still lost me enough lives that I had to put it on blast for being one of the most difficult levels in the entire series for me. As much as I complain about World C3 and its cheap usage of guessing your momentum to fall on small platforms and constant wind, 5-3 was simply one of those that really kicked my teeth in for whatever reason. You think you're doing alright until you're stuck on this stage for half an hour, taking an hour-long break in which you leave the Algata recording the dead air, only to come back with a cooler head and finally overcome the challenge. As if I entered some alternate calm bliss. I thought I'd reach inner peace. It was amazing. Half of these difficulties are all in your heads, friends. Calmer heads tend to prevail more often than pure unbridled gamer rage, as much as it helps. But that could just be me. Other than that, these first two games are still classics. Super Mario Bros. will always hold a special place in my heart for being the first console game I can actively remember playing and beating for the first time when I was something like 5 or 6 years old. The music is still timeless, the gameplay is still as responsive as ever, if a bit stiff and lacking all the nuance of later games, and it's still a must play that everyone who enjoys video games should try it at least once if you somehow haven't already. The Lost Levels is a super hard expansion to one of the most classic games of all time, but it's definitely for those super players who love the original game and think they're up for the challenge. It also introduced the recurring theme of putting faces on objects like certain mountains and clouds and other semi-sentient inanimate objects, so it's kinda neat that that decision was relatively early in the franchise's history. Platformers may have lost their status as the go-to genre in the last 20 years, but Mario started something big here, enough to garner two more 8-bit sequels, one of which is the Black Sheep of the mainline series. As mentioned earlier, the game known to the Western world as Super Mario Bros. 2 is also known as Super Mario USA in Japan. This is because it's a retooled version of a Famicom disc game known as Yume Kojo. Yume Kojo. Doki Doki Panic, otherwise known as Dream Factory, heart-pounding excitement when translated, thank you Mario Wiki and I'm sorry for butchering Japanese. One thing I tend to mention when discussing franchises that often are in long-running series, there's usually a game or two that goes off the beaten path for what a series is now known for. In this case, Super Mario Bros. 2 is that game for the mainline Mario series. Most of this comes down to how different the gameplay is compared to most Mario titles. For one thing, the biggest feature of the game is allowing one of four characters to pick up and throw objects, including makeshift projectiles, keys, and even enemies. Because of this, jumping on enemies doesn't actually defeat them, which is so on Mario that it utterly confused me when I first played the game and its enhanced port when it's launched on the Game Boy Advance as Super Mario Bros. Advance. That's a weird enunciation. The changes are pretty significant beyond changing the base action, even leaking into the framework of the actual story. Quick summary of the plot. Mario has a dream one night about traveling up a staircase leading towards a door to Subcon, the land of dreams. Get it? He is told by the same named inhabitants that the world has been taken over by Wart, leader of the 8-bits. Get it? After being told from a soft voice that Wart hates vegetables, who doesn't? Haha. <laughs> Mario wakes up and heads to a picnic with Luigi, Princess Toadstool, and Toad. When they all discover they shared a similar dream, they happen upon a cave with a familiar looking staircase. Upon reaching the expected door, all four realize their dreams were real and they decide to help the subcon in taking back their world. The fact that the plot is treated as a sort of dream sequence is likely the in-game reasoning to hand wave away a lot of the radical differences in gameplay. I don't find this a problem personally, for Super Mario Bros. 2 actually had a very long-lasting effect on the series' modern identity and I do find it charming in its own way. But if you were expecting a more classic and expected Mario game, you'd better adjust your expectations accordingly. Let's dive into these differences, shall we? One of the biggest influences Super Mario Bros. 2 had on the series' DNA was in adding a bunch of its B-tier worlds. Grassland, desert, waterfall, snow, night, another desert, and then the sky. These are all basic and recurring themes to anyone who's played more than two Mario games, or any mascot platformer in general. Coming off of Super Mario Bros. and the Lost Levels, who rely on grass, underground, athletic, underwater, nighttime, and castle themes, this is a pretty good change in variety as far as I'm concerned. Considering Doki Doki Panic's playable characters are based on an Arabian family, the theming of the game starts to make a lot more sense. The game has the aforementioned 7 worlds with only 20 levels compared to the previous 32, and 52 of its retrospective predecessors. 
While on paper this seems like a huge step down, in practice it isn't as bad as it sounds. While Super Mario Bros. has 8 worlds with 4 linear stages each, Super Mario Bros. 2 goes for a quality versus quantity sort of approach, with 6 worlds with 3 longer and sometimes non-linear levels, while World 7 has only 2 stages. It's a nice change of pace that helps with its laid-back feel of a dream, though the gameplay does increasingly get more involved as you progress. Don't let the premise fool you. This game is infinitely easier than the Lost Levels, which is why everyone outside of Japan received this version instead, but you do need good timing and a calmer mentality than I went into this game with for this very run. Let's detail all the changes to the main formula. Super Mario Bros. 2 gives you a choice between Mario, Luigi, Princess Toadstool, and Toad, each with their own varying strengths and weaknesses. Many of these attributes became standard for these four characters in particular, be it for later Mario platformers or spin-offs such as Mario Kart, and even for crossover titles like Super Smash Bros. Mario is the everyman in all three statistics, speed, jump, and power. Mario is the baseline character in virtually every game he's playable in, and that remains true here. Luigi retains his ability from the lost levels to jump higher with less traction, with the downside of also being weaker. While I didn't mention this earlier, because I was having enough of a time trying to beat it with only Mario cut me a little slack here, the Lost Levels doesn't feature a two-player mode, but it does allow one to play as Luigi, who has the aforementioned traits to differentiate himself from Mario to make the game both easier and harder depending on your preference. If you think the Lost Levels is hard enough, try it with Luigi immediately after playing the entirety of the first game. That physics change drove me nuts, and I've never done it since. Maybe one day I'll check that off the bucket list. Carrying on. Princess Toadstool makes her playable debut here with traits anyone who's played Super Smash Bros. will instantly recognize. She has a below average jump and is the weakest of the four, but she is able to float mid-air to make platforming easier. Save for this moment if you enjoy playing as the Pink Royal, for she is only playable in three of the mainline platformers, though she often is the character you can pick in the many spin-offs. Rounding out the quartet is Toad, a personal favorite of mine, enough so that my screen name is named after a later Toad character from Super Mario RPG. Focus up. Similar to his Mario Kart characteristics, Toad is the fastest and strongest character, and understandably has the worst jump thanks to his short stature. You can select any of the four between levels and after losing a life, so you can easily change strategies if you want to take a different approach to a stage that's giving you trouble. Once you select a character, the game immediately sets itself apart with a distinct opening, dropping your character after they enter subcon. I remember freaking out as a kid, thinking I was somehow being punished for selecting Toad, but it's simply a neat metaphor for how they fall into the dream world. Like falling asleep, get it? Immediately you notice this game's focus on verticality, and how these vertical shafts are used to sometimes reference the arcade Mario Brothers, as walking on the edges of these specific screens will have you appear on the other side, leading to some interesting challenges later on. Super Mario Bros. 2 still uses the power-up system in its most basic form, but it also includes actual heart points this time around. You begin with two in the first game's super transformation, while getting hit to one heart will make you small whoever. Aside from the usual climbing, ducking, running, jumping Mario shtick, Mario 2's biggest gameplay focus is all about picking up and throwing objects. You can pluck vegetables from the ground to throw at enemies, defeating five of which will grant you a small heart. Alongside various veggies, you can also occasionally pluck other items, such as 1-up mushrooms, a stopwatch, a red shell, bombs, and even freaking rockets. It is a dream, remember? It doesn't all have to make sense. Of particular note are these magic potions you can occasionally obtain. When you throw one down, you create a door that leads into subspace, a sort of reverse world if you will. While in the darkened screen, if you threw it on a screen with pluckable grass on the other side, you can pick each of them to gain coins for a bonus chance game for extra lives. On a side note, collectible coins are replaced here with cherries that grant you a starman for every five you collect. Within these stages, it's a chance to find a mushroom or two, which grants you an extra heart for the stage. You have free access to a level, since backtracking is necessary for some of these multi-layered stages, some of which actually make you go all the way to the right of the stage, only to have you travel back to the left in some capacity, sometimes underneath the stage when you were able to preview it Metroid style, while one particularly inspired moment was when you realized you need to hop atop an albatross and make it to an otherwise inaccessible area to progress through the stage. 
These are some good moments, allowing you to explore these stages as much or as little as you want. On the flip side, since there's no timer or score for those who like to play for bragging rights, this lack of urgency or high score can translate into a game that doesn't seem as urgent as the original game was. Eventually, I began ignoring enemies to save on health for the more tricky boss fights and mob encounters gathering four cherries to wait for just the right moment where I might need to use a Starman, in more involved moments where I may have died earlier. While the one benefit for exploring the levels would be for the mushrooms to increase your health for the boss encounters, I eventually gave up halfway through the game since I likely missed half of the locations the first ones were in, and some of the second ones were hidden beyond light puzzle areas, and I couldn't reach the area they dropped in. They also aren't really telegraphed, so it's completely possible that most players, like myself, will simply pluck grass from the direction we approach the patches in. So if you, say, started plucking grass from left to right because you entered from a westward door, if the magic potion is located on the third or fourth patch of grass, you just eliminated most, if not all, of your chances for these coins. Even more likely, the mushrooms begin appearing in screens a fair distance away from the magic potions themselves. So, say in one of the desert stages with long stretches of both enemies and hazards, you might completely miss where they placed this mushroom, feeling like you wasted your opportunity to get something of value, and may have dropped it because an enemy was approaching you or you needed to throw something. What makes these even worse is sometimes, depending on where you place the door to subspace, you can appear immediately in front of respawning enemies, either eating unavoidable damage because you either didn't notice or even see that's where an enemy would spawn, or if you're really lucky, simply cause yourself to lose a life if you aren't fast enough or spawn directly in an enemy if you're small. A second or two of iframes wouldn't have gone amiss when returning to subcon if you're going to keep the game as is, but I almost wish the designers would have simply not spawned enemies on the screen as an alternative. The iframes are likely the better choice here, but by the time you realize you've gotten hit, you may not have a calm enough head to realize you're in trouble because a small gang of sentient snowmen decided to press gang you into joining the army of the dead. Seriously, Flurries were the worst offender here, slipping into me right after taking me immediately down into small form and my own lack of traction and hasty reactions eating at least three deaths this way. Very frustrating. I'd also like to mention a few oddities that had me scratching my head or laughing at how I'd forgotten about them. For one, whales are a pseudo-neutral entity in World 4-2 that spray water from their blowholes as temporary platforms. What I didn't remember was that if you approach them from the sides, it actually damages you, and I got two deaths from this humiliating method. I'm not sure if this sort of kind of attack is present in any other game with water here, but I think my experience with Yoshi's Island, where water simply pushes you back as a hazard, and doesn't actually kill you. Made me laugh out loud at how it killed me twice here. I don't know, dream logic. Another is how I was cautious around cacti initially before realizing that they were perfectly safe platforms alongside pokies. I know I can't be the only one who originally thought to avoid them in the same way I did pokies, as every other game has conditioned me to avoid jumping on sharp objects, especially in the Paper Mario games. It's little things like these that remind me that Super Mario Bros. 2 is a really weird little game, but every nickel I have with it is semi-countered by something charming or fun, like taking control of a Pidgeot's magic carpet, similar to how you would ride Likidu clouds in later installments. But I digress. The game isn't as badly designed as I may have come off from the last few minutes of ranting about it. If you don't rush into danger recklessly and take your time to observe the obstacles being presented to you, you likely won't have too bad of a time. I'm simply voicing my own frustration in the few examples of me having a very tough time in what I consider one of the few bad decisions in lacking in vulnerability time for potentially instant deaths. I also know part of my difficulties were simply readjusting to the changes Super Mario Bros. 2 brought with it, compared to the much more difficult lost levels. Playing a much more relaxed game coming immediately off of arguably the hardest game in the series was likely a mistake on my part. I had the original physics in my head and the gameplay mentality, and it took me until halfway through this game to acclimate to the different sense of the characters in Super Mario Bros. 2, which is why I mostly use Mario by the end of this, so I swear I'm not as awful as some of this gameplay makes me seem. I swear I used to be really good at this when it was my first Game Boy Advance game. So ignore my nitpicky gripe, I admit it's exactly that. Back to the game. For as different as this one was coming off of one of the most famous games of all time, much of Super Mario Bros. 2 bled into the rest of the franchise. Many of these enemies are now commonplace Mushroom Kingdom residents. Shy Guys, Ninji, Sniffits, Pokies, Bobombs. these are all now commonplace Mario enemies that originated from Doki Doki Panic, 
many of which are ingrained in the RPG Mario subseries. Of similar note is how each character is given a special jumping ability in the Power Squat Jump, one of the many alternate jumps Mario would soon be able to pull off in the 3D games. By crouching for a few moments, Mario and friends can build up energy to jump higher than normal, useful for certain vertical obstacles and one particular moving stage. One special enemy of note is Fanto, sentient masks that typically guard keys for locked doors and subcon. These enemies will relentlessly chase anyone who holds the key, until they drop it or it's used and presumably breaks off in the lock Zelda style. For an enemy really only seen in one game and used for a small challenge between areas, Fanto is one of those enemies that really sticks with you, especially if you played the game when you were younger. It was kind of terrifying in a way masks kind of subtly are, though I feel my experience and love for Majora's Mask definitely intensified my admiration for this particular enemy more than most would. I don't know, I really love how simple this threat is, could just be me. Now onto the boss encounters, of which most stages end on. The most frequent boss encounter is the infamous Birdo, the gender indeterminate enemy eventually turns semi-ally who also goes by Catherine in Japanese. It likes to spit out eggs that the player can hop on and throw back, though the alternate colors can also shoot out fire from its snout, requiring either careful timing for the red Birdos and requiring indestructible mushroom blocks for the grey ones. More additional bosses include Bowser, Triclide, Fry Guy, and Claw Grip most of which throw projectiles to be used against them. When finishing most stages, a crystal ball can either be found or relinquished from a birdo that allows the heroes to exit through the bird-like mask gates. In the final stage before challenging Wart, a mask gate will attempt to surprise the player with a boss fight if you don't read the environmental cues that as gamers speak for, we are telegraphing an enemy counter so hard it hurts, so get ready. When you finally face Ward, he has presumably taken over Subcon Castle and has turned it into his factory, and attacks the heroes with the kind of lethal bubbles Nintendo's really fond of. Luckily for the Mushroom Kingdom denizens, the dream machine that Wart uses to create enemies in Subcon are also used to the hero's advantage, granting them vegetables to throw into the evil toad's gaping maw, eventually defeating him with the power of healthy foods. I love this method of defeating a boss, it's so very Dragon Ball-esque in its execution, and it's so innocent that it fits perfectly into a Mario game. Once Ward is defeated, the subcons rejoice as Mario wakes up in his bed. Was it all a dream? Who knows, you aren't playing this for the story. All things considered, Super Mario Bros. 2 is the clear black sheep sequel for the mainline Mario franchise, but this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not as drastic a change as, say, Zelda 2 was compared to its initial game, yet it would be remiss of me to mention how different Mario 2 feels by the simple and major change of how you interact in a Mario game. The fact that jumping doesn't immediately kill everything. The music is nice, the presentation is charming, and the challenge ramps up appropriately right when the concept of plucking and throwing starts to lose its novelty. The change in approach was a welcome sigh of relief after coming off of the Lost Levels, so I may have enjoyed its melotone a little bit more this time than most likely would. Three down, one to go. When it comes to the final 8-bit game, Super Mario Bros. 3 is a great example of a fantastic sequel that pushes the console to its limits. I was too young to enjoy it when any of these classics came out, but reading about it, this game in particular was an event. The Wizard, a film best described as made solely to advertise this one game, is all you need to know for its cultural context. Not that I think Super Mario Bros. 2 is bad, it was simply a path down a side street instead of staying on the main boulevard. So when Super Mario Bros. 3 was shown to make a return to form in the vein of the original Super Mario Bros., I imagine the hype was very real.
Mario was on the rise to become a bonafide video game legend, and the third and fourth games in the classic 2D series pretty much cemented this in the public eye and for the industry as a whole. But enough of this vague historical context. I can confirm Super Mario Bros. 3 is a great game. Definitely one of my favorites in the series. It often battles with World as my favorite 2D Mario game for different reasons, depending on when you ask, as both games have some great strengths that balance each other out. While World is a big enough game that I'll address that in its own video as a proper next-gen sequel in the not-too-distant future, as this series is supposed to be, I'll finish off the NES Air Quotes trilogy and the base All-Stars collection. Super Mario Bros. 3 returns to the Mushroom World in what may or may not be a stage play. While the game gives hints about this being a performance from its opening title screen and the original NES version having Mario cast shadows on the backgrounds, and various blocks being bolted to the set, the remakes don't carry a lot of these details forward, so make of that as you will. The story deals with Bowser returning to the Mushroom World with his children in tow, each invading the neighboring countries near the Mushroom Kingdom. Stealing seven magic wands from seven kings, the Mario Brothers set out to defeat the Koopalings and retake the magic wands to change back the transformed kings. Gameplay returns to the classic jumping and power-up based gameplay that solidified the series' identity that the rest of the platformers will retain. No future Black Sheep mainline games here. Only many, many sub-series and spin-offs. The D-pad is used as you'd expect, with the usual jumping and running attacking prompts, easy peasy. It controls more like you'd expect any modern Mario game to. Mario controls sharply enough to correct a jump slightly if you planned for it, being based more on momentum than even the first game was, which is visible in that fancy power meter as an added stat located on the bottom of the screen as a visible speedometer. More on this edition later. While the basics of controlling Jumpman and his brother are identical, there are minor tweaks that help improve Mario 3 over the original. For one, you can actually grab Koopa shells and use them to hit things like in most Mario games. However, there is one minor annoyance I have on Mario 3 that I fully admit is completely my own fault, and it's the fact that you cannot hold a Koopa shell indefinitely because the Koopa remains in its shell like in Mario 1. I took more unnecessary damage here than I'd care to admit, simply because my modern sensibilities tell me you can hold a turtle shell to use as a shield or weapon at will, and it totally won't pop out in a few seconds and make you lose your power up. Again. Yes, I know this is my own problem, and why sometimes going back to replay previous entries of a series can screw you up as your muscle memory and instinct are often clashing at each other, overriding the mechanics of an earlier game that didn't quite implement something as easy to take for granted today, such as jumping on a Koopa shell now throws them out of their shell so you can grab them and not hurt yourself. One of the many improvements Mario 4 does. Back to Mario 3. Also added is the now standard world map screen. This may be a glorified menu, but it does add that little extra bit of effort and charm while also sometimes including various secrets, specialized levels, and other nice little touches. Incidentally, the Game Boy Color port of Super Mario Bros. also had a visible world map for the original Mushroom Kingdom, something that isn't used in the original or All-Stars versions of the game. Kinda neat. The world map better shows off the various lands in the game, which are pretty standard best of lists that consist of everything you'd expect in a video game level. Grass, desert, water, giant sky, ice, pipe, and dark. Mario 3 contains 96 total levels, a massive jump from the previous games, which includes more traditional levels and shorter one-screen diversions for challenges, chance games, and duels. The variety on display is greatly enhanced here, from the expected numbered levels and returning castle-like stages, to more specialized courses including a desert, pyramid, piranha plant, and hand traps. The more climactic stages are the fortress, tower, airship, and tank levels, usually ending with boss fights to satiate the need to defeat something that gets its own battle theme. In typical Bigger is Better sequel fashion, Mario 3 gives you access to items you can win from various chance games from spade panels on the world map, as well as rewards from treasure chests after defeating certain battle screens. The items are accessed before you select a level, and consist of various power-ups that you can use to give you a boost. The typical ones are all here, including the returning Super Mushrooms, Fire Flowers, and Starman staples, and adds more transformations, including Mario 3's headlining Super Leaf and by extension Tanuki Suit and Special P-Wing, Frog Suit, Karibo slash Goomba Shoe, and the pretty OP Hammer Suit that I actually didn't use this time around, round out the items. 
more special items exist to help make various aspects of the game easier, including anchors, hammers, Lakitu's clouds, music boxes, and magic whistles. There are even more items in the GBA Enhanced port, even an extra world, but I'm on the All-Stars version, so the boomerang, cape, feather, poison mushroom, and vegetables are all unavailable to me for this review. That's a pretty decent selection of options either way, and being able to collect a few for that one instance you might want to use them is a nice sort of difficulty selection. The returning power-ups work in the same manner as Super Mario Brothers, though getting damaged in Mario 3 while in a transformation form will knock you back down to super before getting small, effectively giving you a third chance in which will be appreciated in some of these later stages. The spotlight item in this game is the now popular again Super Leaf for Raccoon Mario and Luigi, which gives you a tail whip attack and the ability to fly as long as your P meter is maxed out, while the Tanuki suit giving the added statue transformation for limited invulnerability and attack. The frog suit is fittingly suitable for improved water control and annoying frog-like jumps that make non-water stages a chore, and the Hammer Brothers cosplay is capable of defeating virtually any enemy you face with hammers, notably excluding the Koopalings, and ducking robs the brothers Mario of sliding down slopes, but it gives you added fire immunity. Lakitu's Cloud lets you skip a level, though a death will send you back before the stage you choose to skip, so choose wisely. The Magic Whistle slash Recorder ripped straight from The Legend of Zelda allows you to travel to the warp zone, which is a glorified level selector depending on when it's used, something I didn't run across through in this playthrough. Because I play every level and I don't want to skip any worlds. The items that affect the world map are half glorified skip level options in practice and assisting in reaching certain stages more easily. Rounding up the skip gameplay items is the music box, items that appropriately make overworld enemy encounters go to sleep temporarily and to skip the confrontations entirely. Hammers are used on the map to open up various paths for secrets and shortcuts, while the remaining anchor item was one I never realized existed until I did some research for this retrospective. Apparently they nailed down airships that you lose a life in that prevents them from traveling across the map. Since I'm the kind of player that defeats all the stages in order before approaching the airships, it wouldn't have helped me too much but shave a few seconds tracking down the airship across freed up maps, but it is an admittedly hidden item to begin with so no harm no foul here. Now that the power-ups were systematically detailed, let's talk some game design. Super Mario Bros. 3 has more than doubled the stages of Mario's 1 through 2. The trade-off of fewer, longer levels is balanced out with Mario 3's levels being more frequent and shorter with more focused challenges. This rapid-fire approach is more evident when playing the more modern 2D games, and especially the 3D games, but that doesn't make Mario 3 a lesser experience. This allows a particular theme, enemy type, or challenge to show up, do its thing, and then step aside for the next challenge an approach quite a few of the 3D games take to heart in the galaxy and other type of 3D games utilize. There's less exploration in these shorter levels, but the challenges are much more focused and with bigger sprites to work with no doubt pushing the NES's capabilities, I found myself dying more to these active obstacle courses, which is not a negative in this case. Once you approach the end of most stages, you're greeted with a roulette box of a card instead of a flagpole. These cards are tallied up after getting three of them for varying extra lives. The spade panels give you a choice of a slot machine-esque minigame, while the end mark spade panels let you play one of these card matching memory games that you can collectively cheese if you cheat and view one of the eight predetermined solutions. I never got these treasure ships to appear, another type of bonus stage, and toad houses give the brothers one of three hidden power-ups. Mario 3 is packed with much more of everything. The enemy roster is massive this time around, with over five dozen types of enemies, ranging from the returning Goombas, Coopers, Mario 3 is packed with much more of everything. The enemy roster is massive this time around, with over five dozen types of enemies, ranging from the returning Goombas, Koopas, Baboms, and even the Angry Sun, to newer series staples that debut here, such as Chain Chomps, Dry Bones, Thwomps, and Boos. They complement the wide assortment of stages for various levels centered around themes, enemy pairings, and timing challenges, including new auto-scrolling levels such as the infamous airship stages. Players proceed to do the platforming thing, choosing to play as many or as little stages as they wish along the way when given the choice. Being the semi-completionist that I am, I always opt to do these stages as chronologically as I possibly can, appreciating the numbers on the main stages to determine the path in which I do them, or at least the order. While items such as Lakitu's Cloud and the Magic Box are nice when you don't want to face specific enemy encounters on the world map, or skip a skates to reach a fortress or spade panel early, I always make sure to sweep a level before challenging the airships. Otherwise, you're simply depriving yourself of gameplay, and that's weird to do unless you really hit a level or doing a speedrun, right? 
Due to the shorter length of the stages and expanded variety, the game can seem to fly by much more quickly than Mario 2 did with its larger and more non-linear levels. Because of this, you're never left in one location or doing any specific type of challenge before quickly passing through it and doing something completely different. Grassland may be the requisite tutorial world, but as early as Waterland you're already facing newer types of enemies. Obstacles and platforms such as donut blocks, quitsand, persistent enemies such as stretchers, and utilizing new bolt lifts. That I fondly remember from Super Mario RPG. All this variety is pared down slightly when it comes to the bosses. Protecting each of the seven Koopalings is Boom Boom, an orange turtle that may or may not be the same individual here, it's sort of vague in his debut. Often found in fortresses, he acts as a mid-world boss encounter, mostly challenging the player with a similar encounter in a one-screen room. He's not that difficult to defeat, the only thing you need to watch out for is when he ducks for spikes and if he decides to either jump or fly before his desperation moves. Essentially the Birdo of Mario 3, Boom Boom wouldn't make a return for a very long time possibly in shame for being so ineffective in escaping Bowser's wrath because of it. Magic balls are dropped whenever Boom Boom is defeated, opening up more of the level for Mario and Luigi to progress through. Not that the Koopalings are much better, they at least face the brothers with the stolen magic wands for added danger and attack patterns. And their fan favorites at this point. While initially portrayed as Bowser's children during the NES release, their status is now much more ambiguous, seen mostly as possibly minions rather than being Bowser's own children. Regardless, they were each sent to seven lands with armies and airships in tow. Fun fact, they're all named after musicians. Larry, Morton Jr., Wendy O., Iggy, Roy, Lemmy, and Ludwig von Koopa. Each possesses a different colored wand used for projectiles along their own pattern of attack, from simply jumping to causing immobilizing ground pounds and even permanent obstacles to make each fight slightly unique. After each one is defeated, Mario or Luigi returns the magic wand back to their respective kings, who are then returned to their original forms. After which Mario receives a letter from the Mushroom Kingdom. Peach will usually wish Mario well with some sort of in-game hints or advice, before Bowser sends the seventh letter and reveals he kidnapped her while they were off adventuring. Reaching Darkland, a multi-stage world comprised of stages with no sunlight where King Koopa makes his first real castle location in a hellish area, the Mario Brothers proceed to tackle some of the toughest stages in the game, full of auto-scrolling tank and airship stages, three hand trap levels, and trickier stages filled with puzzle elements to make you act carefully and pay attention to your surroundings. Upon eventually reaching Bowser, who returns in a manner similar to his initial appearance in Super Mario Bros., with relentless fireballs fired from the right side of the screen, he now attempts to ground pound Mario or Luigi, and thus the solution quickly becomes clear. Once defeated, it's a happy ending for the Mushroom World, as temporary peace is restored as the stage play comes to a close. What is likely clear by now is how I adore this series' origins. They're classics that I believe still hold up very well decades later, as it's hard to ruin a platformer if the controls are still tight and the hitboxes work this well, put alongside great level design, variety, and a charming presentation with timeless music that will stay stuck with you for days after you complete each title and is still here as I read this off. As far as these four 8-bit titles go, there is a clear improvement and willingness to change things up, making each entry distinct with the slight exception of the Lost Levels, which admittedly was why we didn't receive it outside of Japan for years. These games are all worth your time if you enjoy platformers or simply want to get into this medium. Mario is synonymous with video games, and he stuck around for very good reason. His mainline games began with some very solid foundations coming off of the early arcade Donkey Kong games. Nintendo wouldn't hold a major monopoly on nostalgia with a capital N if their legacy wasn't valued by millions of people. I know I didn't say anything new or mind-blowing for many Mario or Nintendo fans, but I do hope my enthusiasm for these games came across with a semi-in-depth dive into some of my favorite games growing up. Were I to rank these three from my favorite on down, it would definitely be Mario 3, 1, and then 2 with the Lost Worlds being included with Super Mario Bros. This isn't to say Mario 2 is garbage, even though I can see why the argument would be made given how different and off it feels compared to its surrounding games, but I don't really mean to imply that. It's a good game that I feel is the middle child clearly overshadowed by the quality of its big and little siblings. It's like riding a roller coaster, switching up to a calm or flume ride, then going back to another roller coaster. I have the weirdest knowledge. Mario games can be played in any order, but I feel I'm doing some sort of little insignificant service 
by going in release order and seeing how past games affect the series' overall identity and how newer games pull and learn from previous installments. This initial trilogy is still well worth checking out if you can play any version of All Stars. Each game is available digitally on any currently supported Nintendo platform as well, and I would definitely recommend 3 over 1 if you needed to check out only one game as far as this monster of a franchise is concerned. Heck, all three of the games are on the NES Classic if you can manage to get your hands on one, you lucky devils. It's honestly not hard to play any of these titles, so maybe I'm simply speaking into the uncaring void of an internet who doesn't need some random fan gushing over what makes these games worthwhile to me. Long story short, go play these games, even if it's only just once. Newer games wouldn't keep referencing Mario 1 and 3 specifically if they didn't have good ideas and nostalgia to draw from, though it helps that they were immensely popular. I am immensely sorry it took me, what, 10 weeks to get this out? I lost a bunch of motivation after losing a bunch of my footage when my laptop died on me, but I never threw away this idea. I love these games too much to not eventually dive back in, and continued on to cover the 4 slash 5 games to make up for anyone who cares about my opinion somehow. At least I covered 3, technically 4 games, and I'm already recording footage for Super Mario World as this goes up, and that already has a script I'm fiddling with as I look over my second playthrough which will not take nearly as long, I swear. If all goes well, that will have gone up about a week after this one's published online, so it's a moot point anyway for most, and you'll simply see if I'm a liar or can't foresee my own scheduling. Either way, see you in the view for Super Mario Bros. 4, as I actually continue in a series for once. I'll somehow get around to covering Metal Gear 2 soon, and hopefully figure out how to get quality footage of Metroid 2 and its remake so I can fully dive back into Metroid. I love that series. I just received Uncharted 4 and its expansion pack The Lost Legacy as a late Christmas present from a friend, so I might push up the main Uncharted games and The Last of Us, since that's also getting its second game really soon too, huh? It'll be good to mix classics and modern series. Keeps me on my feet with a variety on things I have to talk about and I do have opinions on those games in particular. And was it great to get that Kingdom Hearts 3 news last week or what? Monsters Inc., Marluxia, Vanitas, and Utada returning? Hype Train is back on track. But is it optimistic to believe it's gonna remain a 2018 title? Fingers crossed, but don't be surprised if it doesn't make it. I just hope it can finally surpass Kingdom Hearts 2 final mix for me. I need to get on reviewing Kingdom Hearts, if only because 3 is finally going to be released probably within a year, hopefully, fingers crossed, please. I also hope you all had a great Valentine's Day no matter what happened to you. If you were with people, I hope you loved them, and if you were alone, I still love you. Probably. Maybe. <laughs> See you next video.